Aging is a fascinating topic. Nobody really wants to age. And I don't mean that we all want to live forever, but it's rather the effects that come with aging, like the inevitable decline of vitality and health. However, what I think is even more fascinating is that we all seemingly age at a different speed. And this sometimes becomes clearly visible by just looking at somebody. Would you have guessed that Brad Pitt and Dean Norris are the same age? Or how many years do you think are these two apart? To understand why we age and why some people age faster and then others again seemingly stay young forever is sometimes helpful to look at extremes. These are four pictures of the same woman. And while it seems like that the second and third picture have to be at least 40 years apart, there's only a 15 year difference. The woman suffers from a rare genetic disorder called Werner syndrome, which makes her age much, much faster. The median age of death for people with Werner syndrome is 54.3 years, so about two and a half decades earlier than for the average human. So why do people with Werner syndrome age much faster and what can we learn from this? Let's hold the thought for a second and talk about what age actually means. Sure, we have chronological age, which basically measures how long you have been alive. And if you're not traveling close to a black hole or something, chronological age passes pretty much the same for all of us on Earth, give or take a few nanoseconds. Then there's also the biological age, which basically defines how fit and functional all of your cells in your body are, which in turn then determines your vitality and health. And unlike the chronological age, the biological age actually explains why some people outlive others by decades, even if we forget about genetic diseases. To give you an example, this study found that the biological age of centenarians is on average 8.6 years younger than would be expected based on their chronological age, which is most likely also the reason why they could reach such a high chronological age, because their biological age stayed young. Okay, but how do we measure this? How do we know what their biological age actually is? I'm glad you're asking, because there are many ways to measure this, but over the years, the most accurate and best scientific method to measure biological aging has to do with the epigenetic clock. The prefix epi comes from the Greek language and stands for over, so over or on top of genetics. Your genetic information is stored by arranging the four bases just in the right order to make you. But consider this for a moment. All cells of your body have pretty much the same DNA. So a neuron has the same DNA as an immune cell, as a skin cell or as a liver cell. But they obviously look very different and fulfill very different tasks. This is made possible by epigenetic regulations. The study of epigenetics means to look at modifications made to the genome, but that do not affect the DNA sequence. So that do not change the organization of the four bases that made up your DNA, but that are passed on along as cells divide. And these modifications then control what genes are expressed and in turn control what cell has what duty, what function. Imagine the genome as a keyboard where each gene is a key, except that you have about 20,000 keys. Epigenetic modifications tell enzymes, aka your fingers, what keys to press at what time, literally writing the code of life. So epigenetics is what makes a skin cell a skin cell or an immune cell an immune cell. But it doesn't stop here. Cells need to adapt rapidly to ever-changing environments. 
So they have to be extremely flexible in what genes are turned on and turned off and have to act pretty much immediately to external stimuli. Now imagine that one or two genes are not pressed the way they should be, but completely different genes are expressed. Well, we can probably handle this, but if mistakes accumulate over time, cells start to lose their cellular identity. They become senescent. We can track epigenetic changes over time and feed the information into algorithms that then with extremely high accuracy can predict somebody's biological age. To date, there is one algorithm that stands out so far by its high accuracy, developed by Professor Steve Horvath. You give me a DNA sample from any cell of the body, I can tell you your age. Okay, but how does the method actually work? Out of the four base pairs, DNA consists of two of them, adenine and cytosine, can be modified by adding a small molecule to it, a so-called methyl group. And this acts as a tiny molecular tag that controls gene expression. Now, those changes are incredibly small. but they are sufficient to control what gene at what time is expressed and what gene is silenced. So in humans, these methyl tags most often happen at so-called CPG sites, which are simply sites in the genome where a cytosine precedes a guanine. In his 2013 paper, Professor Horvath characterized 353 CPG sites that together form an aging clock. By looking at these 353 sites, one can predict somebody's age with extremely high accuracy, a correlation of 0.96. It also works to measure the biological age of cancer cells. But, maybe not too surprisingly, cancer cells show a significant age acceleration with an average of 36 years. Now here's the really cool thing. Methylation patterns are reversible. Unlike the sequence of our DNA, which is pretty much set in stone, give or take a few mutations, epigenetics are changeable. Anyways, correlation does not imply causation, right? Epigenetic modifications may simply be a byproduct of aging rather than the universal cause of it. Well, Professor David Sinclair dares to argue differently. In fact, he wrote a whole book about it, explaining his theory that aging is caused by loss of epigenetic information. Professor Sinclair and others could show that by introducing epigenetic noise, they could make cells age faster, which eventually led to a loss of cellular identity. Now for a cell, losing its identity basically means that it stops to do what it's supposed to do like hunting down a pathogen in the case of an immune cell. And in some extreme cases, they could even see that cells showed signs of becoming a totally different cell lineage. So meaning a skin cell stopped being really a skin cell and started to show signs of, for instance, neurons or immune cells. In fact, in a preprint paper, Professor Sinclair and his colleagues found that the muscle tissue in treated ICE mice, that is mice with inducible changes to the epigenome, had shifted more towards an immune cell. In one study, they could even make mice age faster by taking out proteins responsible for epigenetic regulations, called sirtuins, or they could make mice live longer by giving them extra copies of these proteins. In fact, 
they actually found that simply supplementing mice with a drug that upregulates or activates these proteins could make old mice become the equivalent of ultramarathon runners. Okay, the question still remains, what actually causes epigenetic modification? So whenever Professor Sinclair or any other researchers wanted to introduce epigenetic noise, what they did was they induced random double strand breaks inside the genome. These double strand breaks by themselves were not dangerous and were usually repaired quite rapidly. But what it requires to repair them is to recruit uh, proteins that are also important for epigenetic regulations. Here illustrated in blue. It's green, not blue. Uh, here illustrated in green. And this recruits the proteins that then make sure that the DNA is repaired properly. And if this happens a couple times, that's not a big deal. The cell can handle this. But the more frequently this happens, the less the proteins important for epigenetic regulations can focus on their main duty, which is really making sure that the cell does not lose its cell identity by controlling epigen the epigenome. And so over time, when DNA double strand breaks accumulate, this leads to an erosion of the epigenome. So instead of having on one part of the genome a lot of modifications, we get fewer there, and where we usually don't have any, there some epigenetic modifications may accumulate. And this is exactly what Professor Sinclair and the others see in their paper when they look at what happens when Dallas strand breaks are caused and what actually causes the epigenetic noise. The noise basically means a redistribution of the epigenetic signature. Now, coming back to the woman with Werner syndrome in the beginning, Werner syndrome is actually caused by a mutation in a protein that is important for DNA damage repair. So that's how the circle closes. The woman has a protein that is less capable of doing so. So there is more need for other proteins to help out with the repair. And therefore there is an erosion of the epigenetic landscape. There are things one can do to slow biological aging, ranging from lifestyle and diet changes over supplements to molecular therapies that are nowadays tested in labs around the world. So science is moving faster every day and maybe we may be the last generation that doesn't meet its great, 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 great grandchildren. Thank you for watching.